All right, and welcome back for another Comlex Review lecture that we were planning to give in person today, Friday the 20th, but coronavirus had other ideas, and so now we've got a video. So I'll make sure that we have the link to this, Drawing the Abdominal Vasculature, embedded in the email that goes out to you. Essentially, if you want to see a step-by-step -step drawing of how the abdominal vasculature works, that video is up and available, so you can check it out. So let's get started with a few questions. I'll basically just let you pause this at your own your your own time, come up with an answer, and then I will click through. So go ahead and pause now if you need time to read through it. And the answer is esophageal veins, and we'll go through why as we continue through the session. Next question. Go ahead and pause. And the answer is next question. Go ahead and pause the video now. And the answer is... Next question. And the answer is... And I believe our final question for the moment... And the answer is right there. So let's talk abdominal vasculature now that we've got ourselves primed. So, so here we have a view of the abdominal aorta and the vessels that are going to the gut tube. The big three that we care about right now are the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. So let's take a look at the variety of vessels that are coming from it. So right here we've got the foregut and the celiac trunk is right here giving off its left gastric artery going to the left side of the lesser curvature of the stomach. We have the splenic artery going right off the uh, celiac trunk here, traveling posterior to the stomach towards the spleen. No surprise there. We have some short gastric arteries coming off the splenic artery and going to the fundus of the stomach. Right here, also off the splenic, we have the left gastroomental artery going to the greater curvature of the stomach and the greater omentum. Now over here we have the third typical branch off the celiac trunk, that's the common hepatic artery, and that's going to be traveling to the right side of the body, and it will split into a variety of vessels. Here we've got the proper hepatic artery traveling to the liver itself, and coming off the proper hepatic, typically we have the right gastric artery going along the lesser curvature of the stomach and anastomosing with the left gastric artery across the curvature. A little further superiorly, the proper hepatic branches into a left and right hepatic artery. The right is somewhat obscured by the common hepatic duct here, but we can see it going up to the liver just a bit further. And coming off the right hepatic artery, typically we have the cystic artery right there. Now, the common hepatic stops being the common hepatic when it gives off the proper hepatic and this other daughter branch, the gastroduodenal artery. And it's a little bit obscured by the right gastric here, and it actually only exists very briefly. So we'll see some better views of it in a moment. One th thing to note here is that off of it, in some way, shape, or form, we do get our right gastroomental artery, which is traveling on the greater curvature of the stomach and, once again, supplying the stomach and the greater omentum. So here, we've lifted up the stomach and the greater omentum, exposing the pancreas, splenic artery, and some of the other structures here like the duodenum, and transitioning into the jejunum. So here, once again off the celiac trunk, we can see the left gastric artery, the splenic artery, very torturous. Actually, in real life, it's usually even more torturous and kind of uh, curved than we see here in the illustration. There's that left gastromental artery coming from it and traveling to the greater curvature and greater omentum. Small gastric arteries might be up here. Now, off the splenic artery, we have multiple branches traveling to the pancreas. Generally, we're going to have the dorsal or posterior pancreatic artery here, very proximal off the splenic artery, traveling into its body. And a little further along, we have the greater pancreatic artery, followed by the artery to the tail of the pancreas, sometimes called the caudal pancreatic artery. And just note that these form a network within the pancreas that will meet up with these vessels over here. Now those vessels, 
To get to them, we have to start looking at branches of the common hepatic artery. So it's traveling to the right here, gives off the proper hepatic, which is mostly obscured hereafter, but we do see the right gastric artery coming off of it, going to the lesser curvature. Here is that short gastroduodenal artery, and it's given off the the right gastroomental artery here, but right now I want you to pay attention to these branches that are traveling on the anterior and posterior side of the head of the pancreas. These are two of the superior pancreatic duodenal arteries, and if you want to be very picky, it's the anterior superior and the posterior superior pancreatic duodenal arteries that are traveling around the head of the pancreas and supplying branches to the duodenum as well. Ah, and there's that right gastromental artery. So now we've gone a little bit deeper and we're actually going to have taken the stomach out. It's been cut out along with the greater omentum and we can see a lot of the same structures with a slightly different view. So let's run through this. We've seen the other branches already but here's the proper hepatic branching to the left and right hepatic and a nice view of the cystic artery coming off the right hepatic right there. The gastroduodenal artery is coming down giving off its branches. One that we didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to earlier is a small branch that's going to the superior part of the duodenum. It's called the supraduodenal artery. It's right there. And here, off the gastroduodenal, we have the posterior superior pancreatic duodenal and anterior superior pancreatic duodenal. Now, that's a mouthful already, but it gets better because we have to have some branches that are going to the underside of the same organ and they're coming off the superior mesenteric artery which supplies the midgut. So the pancreas, its head and part of the duodenum is where we transition from foregut to midgut and we've got inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries there, an anterior and posterior inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. When trying to keep these straight, just remember quadrants. We have an anterior and a posterior. We have a superior and an inferior. And if you come up with every permutation of that and slap the word pancreatic or duodenal artery onto it, you'll be able to figure out which vessel is which. Now, in addition, we have an inferior pancreatic artery coming off the superior mesenteric, feeding into that network that's going to be fed also by branches of the splenic artery, the posterior, greater pancreatic arteries as well as the artery to the tail of the pancreas, nice big anastomotic network in there fed by all those vessels. And there's the splenic right there and all the stuff I just said got ahead of myself but you can read it on the screen now. So now let's talk midgut. We've zoomed away a little bit. We can see the pancreas here, stomach's been cut, duodenum right here, transitioning to jejunum, ileum, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, and that's about where we're leaving off. And we can see a lot of branching of the superior mesenteric artery in this view. So here, superior mesenteric artery is going to give off those inferior pancreatic or duodenal arteries that we saw earlier. That inferior pancreatic artery is hanging out right there. I didn't bother labeling it, but it is there. What we do notice here are a huge amount of jejunal arteries. These jejunal arteries are going to the proximal part of the small bowel and notice that they have relatively simple arcades or loops in here but very long straight arteries or vasa recta going from those arcades out to the gut itself. When we look at the next part, the ileal arteries, the arcades tend to be more complex, multiple loops of arcade there and relatively short vasa recta extending off of them to the ileum. In addition to that, we have an iliocolic artery traveling here. Typically, we describe this as going at about a 7 or 8 o'clock direction on a clock face, and it's basically heading towards the cecum. It gives off some anterior and posterior cecal branches as well, but it'll supply the very proximal part of the ascending colon, some of the distal ileum, and a big deal, it's typically where we have the appendicular artery to the vermiform appendix arising. Now in addition, we often have a what we'll call 9 o'clock on the clock face artery coming off the superior mesenteric. That's going to the ascending colon primarily, and that's the right colic artery. And at noon, we have a nub in this illustration of the middle colic artery to the transverse colon. But as the transverse colon has been cut, we don't really have that artery. So let's take another view. This time, we've lifted up the intact colon, so transverse colon's been lifted up, it's hanging by its mesentery, 
and the small intestines have been taken out, aside from this very proximal part of the jejunum, so the jejunal and ileal arteries are gone, but we still have superior mesenteric giving off the ileocolic, there's that appendicular artery right there, right colic, primarily to the ascending colon, you can see the middle colic artery now, pretty heavily feeding into the transverse colon, coming off the clock face at about noon, and the middle colic artery is pretty much where we stop getting blood into the gut tube from the superior mesenteric artery. We transition in the vicinity of the splenic flexure here from the midgut to the hindgut, and the hindgut's blood supply is the inferior mesenteric artery coming off the aorta right here. Now the inferior mesenteric artery gives off a left colic artery, so 3 o'clock on the clock face goes to the descending colon, left colic artery. Then we have some loops that are going to give off sigmoid arteries, branches of those, and finally we have the superior rectal artery traveling, no surprise, to the superior part of the rectum. This is the final branch coming from the inferior mesenteric artery, and we'll see some other branches to the rectum down here that are coming from more uh, systemic sources like the internal iliac artery. One thing to note before we move on is that your left colic artery and middle colic artery tend to be linked by what's known as the marginal artery of Drummond. Now you can actually have multiple linking arteries in here. The arc of Riolan is a surgical name that people have been pimped with before. It's just the name for an arc of artery that's here in addition to the marginal artery running along the margin of the colon in this area. So on this slide, we have a nice clear view, not so much of the arteries, but the veins draining the gut tube. And we're basically going to fill in the same names of the arteries with veins, but their drainage pattern is considerably different. So let's follow those. We have the superior rectal vein here, leading from the superior part of the rectum, joining the sigmoid veins, draining the sigmoid colon, and then joined by the left colic vein, draining the descending colon. These consolidate into the inferior mesenteric vein, and here's where we diverge from the typical pattern that we saw at the arteries. The inferior mesenteric vein will fuse, drain its blood into the splenic vein, draining a ton of blood from the spleen, pancreas, other related structures here, and then we've got the superior mesenteric vein. Now the superior mesenteric vein does indeed have jejunal veins, ileal veins, ileocolic veins, right colic veins, middle colic veins, etc. All the same names, but they're going to be draining their blood to the superior mesenteric vein. And when we have the splenic vein meet the superior mesenteric vein, that is going to be when we come up with the hepatic portal vein, which is carrying all the blood from our GI tract to the liver to be filtered before kind of uh, being dumped into the caval system. So all the blood from here has to pass through the liver before the portal system is going to be joining the caval system. But sometimes this breaks down. Now one thing I want you to note, since there's no celiac vein, we have most of the celiac branches draining directly to the liver. Now since many of them went to the liver in the first place, the liver's blood flow and its venous return will just join the hepatic veins going to the caval system. But the right and left gastric veins will join the hepatic portal vein directly and I want you to note right here the final part of the esophagus getting some blood going into the right gastric vein but the more uh, superior part of the esophagus is going to drain to the azygous vein system in the thorax that's going to become important in just a minute and here it is there are places where we have this portal system connect to very weakly caval veins veins that drain directly to the inferior or superior vena cava. And in this case, we're going to look at what those are because that's when you can develop problems. If you have portal hypertension, you wind up with blockage in the liver due to cirrhosis or other causes, the blood pressure inside these hepatic portal vein tributaries builds up. And liquid, like blood, only knows to go where pressure tells it. So as that pressure builds, it will push its way into any channel it can to get away from that high pressure area. So right here, let's review. Superior rectal veins, sigmoid veins, left colic veins are all draining into the inferior mesenteric vein, which in turn joins the splenic vein. Superior mesenteric veins consolidate together into a single superior mesenteric vein fuses with the splenic vein to create the hepatic portal vein, and we've got 
the right and left gastric veins as well as the gastroomentals getting into the system as well. The gastric veins tend to drain directly to the hepatic portal vein right there and note that we've got that esophageal vein right here coming off the right gastric vein draining a portion of the esophagus. So down here we have middle and inferior rectal veins that are going to be draining to the internal iliac vein and if we've got portal hypertension we can wind up with superior rectal vein blood enlarging the vessels nearby to get into these caval veins and that is a possible cause of hemorrhoids. Over here on both the ascending and descending colon, I'm only showing it on this side but it's happening on both, there are some small veins connected to the body wall that are going to drain to the lumbar segmental veins and other things of that nature and if we have portal hypertension some venous blood backing up into these very small uh, ilio, uh, let's say that, probably right colic veins ileocolic veins, some of that blood will back up and actually filter its way into those body wall veins and then get into the caval system that way. In general, these don't tend to cause too many big clinical problems. People don't present with real problems here because it's very deep and it's very diffuse over a wide area. Now here, we have the false form ligand connecting the liver to the anterior body wall and there are actually some small veins draining blood from that false form ligament that connect to the umbilicus. If we have portal hypertension, these can actually enlarge and the venous blood from this portal system here, from the portal vein, can actually push out through the falciform uh, ligament veins and get to the umbilicus and swell para-umbilical veins on the body wall that are here and then go to the femoral vein down in the thigh or to the axillary vein up in the armpit. When that happens, these veins can get really huge, and those perimbilical veins fanning out from the umbilicus are sometimes called a caput medusa, or medusa's head, because it looks like a bunch of snakes coming out of the umbilicus. Nice little classical reference there. Enjoy. Last but not least, we have the esophageal veins here draining to the portal system. If there's portal hypertension, these can enlarge and drain to esophageal veins in the thorax that send their blood to the azygous vein or the um, hemiazygous vein on the right and left side of the thorax and if these enlarge these very thin veins inside the lumen of the esophagus can balloon tremendously and this is a big problem because those esophageal varices are prone to rupture and a person can exsanguinate aka bleed out through their mouth when those veins rupture. So it's a pretty big deal to make sure that you've got an understanding of how the portal system and the caval system can connect during portal hypertension. Mm -hmm. All right, some more questions. Take a moment, read, pause. When you're ready for the answer, unpause. All right, and next. Go ahead and pause again. And the answer. Okay, so now let's go into why those answers are what they are. So, the stomach is going to release its contents, which are low pH, very acidic, into the duodenum. And the duodenum gets its name, I thought this was neat, from being 12 fingers in breadth when it was first described. So duodenum, 12 fingers in breadth, sure. It's going to be stretching from the stomach down here to the jejunum, like most of the small intestine, it has little folds present on its surface called the plique circularis, but we have a couple other little landmarks we'll delve into in just a moment. The four portions of it are the superior portion of the, of the duodenum, so it's getting gastric contents from the pyloric sphincter right here when it opens, and the duodenum has lots of uh, Brunner's glands or duodenal glands in it that are going to increase the pH of the acidic stomach contents, so bring it back up to a more biologic pH takes a little time to do it, so it's still relatively low pH in the duodenum, but by the time we get to the jejunum, that pH has come back to more or less uh, what we'd expect throughout the body. The descending duodenum is very important because it's where the pancreatic and bile, uh, so pancreatic enzymes and bile are going to be released into the duodenum to help mobilize fats and dissolve proteins and uh, carbohydrates, other structures. We have the inferior duodenum right here. Note that the superior mesenteric vessels pass immediately anterior to it, and sometimes this part can actually be compressed by traction 
of the midgut down across the inferior part of the duodenum. Then we've got the ascending duodenum, the fourth part right here. It tends to be anchored by a little fibromuscular ligament called the ligament or muscle of trites, and thereafter it's going to be the jejunum. Now, one thing we care about the duodenum in particular is its relationship to the gallbladder. And the gallbladder, we care about it in its relationship to the liver. So let's talk about where things are located. The liver takes up a huge amount of space. It's great big right lobe, smaller left lobe, and much smaller quadrate and caudate lobes. The bile in the liver is going to drain into the biliary tree here. We'll see more on that in a minute. And the gallbladder is located right on its under surface, its inferior surface, fairly anterior. The duodenum is here, the bile ducts are posterior to the duodenum, and the pancreas, its head, is nestled in this little C-curve of the duodenum as we go from superior descending and inferior aspects. The transverse colon is located immediately anterior to the duodenum, and the duodenum can actually be a little tough to find in the anatomy lab as you have to get the intestines, the large intestine, out of the way and peel the duodenum off the posterior body wall. So let's talk about how bile flow happens. Bile is produced by the hepatocytes in the liver. It's released into little tiny bile canaliculi that consolidate into larger and larger bile ducts until they reach the left hepatic duct, which is getting bile from the left lobe of the liver, the caudate and quadrate lobes. So right there. And that's joined by the right hepatic duct, which is coming from that huge right lobe of the liver. So this is going to fuse, and at that point we have what's called the common hepatic duct. So right and left hepatic ducts fuse to make the common hepatic duct, and then we become the common bile duct when we're joined by the cystic duct. But we're going to not label him yet. We'll draw a little more attention there in a moment. But that's why the name change happens from here to here. Bile is going to flow down the common hepatic duct to the common bile duct, and through this opening, which we'll talk about in a moment, into the second part of the duodenum. And that's where it's going to mobilize fats and help aid in digestion. Now bile is created all the time by the liver, but we don't want it in our intestines all the time either. So we need a way to th kind of store it, use it when we need it. So we're going to have a constriction of the sphincter down here. Oh, I should also mention the main pancreatic duct tends to join the common bile duct at its very terminal end, so if you have problems with one system, you likely have problems with another. But right here, we're going to constrict the hepatopancreatic sphincter, and the bile flow is then going to reverse. It's going to travel up the common bile duct, but instead of backing up into the liver and causing jaundice, what we'd really like to have happen is for that bile to divert down our cystic duct and wind up in our gallbladder. And in the gallbladder, it's going to be concentrated and stored until we have a big fatty meal, gallbladder contracts, squeezes that bile down into the intestines. And there it is, gallbladder right there. Obviously, a lot of problems can occur in this situation if you have infections of the gallbladder or you have the bile crystallizing and forming gallstones. All those can cause problems, especially if those stones lodge anywhere along this pathway. And note, if we have it lodged here in the area just after the common bile duct and main pancreatic duct are fused, we can compromise both the biliary drainage and drainage of the pancreas. So let's take a close-up view here. The common bile duct comes together with the major pancreatic duct and they're going to fuse right here and open into the duodenum at the major duodenal papilla. That's the name of the opening, that little bump right there. And the hepatopancreatic ampulla of Vater is the actual space where they're going to be fusing. Now they're surrounded by the hepatopancreatic sphincter, also known as the sphincter of Odi, that's going to constrict to allow bile to back up into the common bile duct and also hold pancreatic secretions until the stomach's ready or the intestines are ready for it. There's sometimes a minor pancreatic duct that's going to open into a minor duodenal papilla. Sometimes this is kept as a separate opening for the pancreatic uh, secretions, but other times it's not present, so it may or may not be there. All right, now we're going to do some questions regarding a common problem that we have in the abdominal area. It's going to be hernias, so pause, and here is the answer. Another one. 
And the answer is, and last one. Okay, there we go. So let's talk abdominal wall and hernias. So right here, the inguinal region basically describes the place where the abdomen meets the upper thigh, and that crease is the inguinal region. We have an inguinal ligament here. And note that it's dominated by the aponeurosis of the external abdominal oblique muscle. So external abdominal oblique muscles here, the muscle fibers are giving off this aponeurotic tendon, this flat sheet that fans out to attach to the linea alba, as well as to the pubic tubercle and su anterior superior iliac spine. That fusion creates the inguinal ligament, so it's just part of the abdominal, external abdominal obliques aponeurosis. Pardon me, too twitchy there, too much coffee. So here, note that we have a gap in the inguinal region and in the external abdominal oblique for the spermatic cord. So in males, we have a big spermatic cord traveling through this gap that is the external or superficial inguinal ring right there. There are going to be fibers on either side of it, so we're going to have what's called the lateral crus here, the medial crus on the other side, and the ring itself is that space between them. Note that there are sometimes intracrural fibers running between those that are described. There are sometimes not quite this artistically pronounced, but intracrural fibers are just spanning the lateral and medial crura of the superficial inguinal ring, and the spermatic cords traveling through. In women, we have a remnant of the gubernaculum that's going to be the round ligament of the uterus coming through the same space, not taking up quite as much room, and distributing itself through the connective tissue of the labia majora. So, in males, the fact that we've got the testes descending through the body wall, pulling the spermatic cord behind it, creates a really big space that gut can herniate through when abdominal pressure inside the abdomen goes way up. And this can cause a lot of problems. So just review real quick, the testes were inside the abdomen, but not in the abdominal cavity. They were retroperineal. They developed and quote unquote descended, pulling the ductus deferens here and the testicular artery and vein and lymphatics behind them. And as it passed through, the peritoneum, or passed under the peritoneum, it didn't really pick up any layer from it because it's behind the peritoneum, but as it passed through the transversalis fascia, thin fascia just external to the parietal peritoneum, that fascia surrounds the ductus deferens and the testicular artery and vein and makes the internal spermatic fascia. Then it's going to pass through the transversus abdominis muscle and it does not get anything from it. There's a little gap there. But as it goes through the internal abdominal oblique, it actually gets a couple neat things. A slip of muscle from the internal abdominal oblique attaches to it to make the cremaster muscle that helps to raise the testes. And it's going to get a branch of the genital femoral nerve to innervate that portion of the muscle. As it passes through the external abdominal oblique, making the superficial inguinal ring, all of that is then surrounded by the external spermatic fascia, which is going to tether all of it together and keep the testes connected to these internal structures right there. It's important to note that the ilioinguinal nerve is often described as exiting through the superficial inguinal ring. It's really just traveling in the space between the transversus abdominis and internal abdominal oblique here, and it gets to the skin in this area, sometimes kind of popping out of that ring, but it's not going through into the scrotum. It's staying on the anterior abdominal wall, very close to the upper, uh, upper portion of the genitalia. So here's a nice view of everything making up the spermatic cord. The ductus deferens has its own little artery right there, and then we've got the testicular artery and vein nearby. We've got some lymph and nerve structures that are going to be innervating the testes, draining lymph from them, etc. So that's the innermost stuff in the spermatic cord. And as it passes through the uh, transversalis fascia, it gets that internal spermatic fascia layer right here. As it passes through the transversus abdominis muscle, it gets nothing. As it passes through the cremaster muscle, it's going to get, sorry, not the cremaster, through the internal abdominal oblique, it gets the cremaster layer of muscle and fascia and the genitofemoral nerve to go along with it. There's often also an artery 
that's supplying that muscle individually. So just be aware, some people will say you have to know there's three arteries within the spermatic cord. Then as it passes through the external abdominal oblique, it gets external spermatic fascia right there. And that's what makes up the outermost layer of the spermatic cord. From inside, we want to pay attention to this triangle right here. Now before we do that, we're going to look at a few landmarks that are present on the internal aspect of the anterior abdominal wall. On this side, the parietal perineum is still intact. On this side, it's been removed and we see that kind of flimsy, spiderwebby looking transversalis fascia covering the anterior abdominal wall. And that's even been opened up a little bit right here to show some of the layers of the uh, aponeuroses of the abdominal muscles. So let's look at the structures that are here. Laterally, covering the inferior epigastric artery and vein, which supply the rectus abdominis muscle right there, we have what's called the lateral umbilical fold. We go a little more medially, we have the old umbilical artery. Now when we were in the, in the womb and we had a placenta, there's a huge amount of blood traveling through this artery on the right and left to our umbilicus to make the umbilical artery. Once the placenta was clamped and we didn't need it anymore and our lungs came online, this became fibrous. So this cord or um, obliterated umbilical artery is still present and it's folded over to create the medial umbilical fold. And it still connects down to branches of the internal iliac artery that are going to supply the bladder. So the superior vesicle arteries are coming off of it before it gets obliterated. And then Right on the midline, we have the median umbilical fold, which is a remnant of the urachus, an extension off the top of the urinary bladder that goes straight to the umbilicus. So if we need to find the bladder, especially if we're doing something by scope and we don't have an open dissection, if we can identify the medial, sorry, median umbilical fold, we can get to the bladder. If we need to find the internal iliac vessels, we identify the medial umbilical fold and we can get there. We need to identify the external iliac artery and vein. We follow the lateral umbilical fold to get there. So now that we've got a sense of the vessels and the folds that are present on the anterior abdominal wall's interior side, let's take a look at how that's affected by hernias. So right here, we have the rectus abdominis muscle. Transversalis fascia has been removed. We've just got some aponeuroses here. Transversus abdominis muscles present here, and here are the Exter yeah, the uh, external iliac artery and vein passing deep to the inguinal ligament to create the femoral artery and vein. Now before they do that, they're going to give off the inferior epigastric artery and vein. And right here we can see the testicular artery and vein along with the ductus deferens passing nearby to exit the deep inguinal ring right here to go through the inguinal canal and actually pop out the superficial inguinal ring eventually. So now that we've got that organized, let's take a look at the weak spots that are here. First and foremost, if we've got a spermatic cord pushing its way through the body wall to get to the scrotum, we automatically have a weak spot. This is the deep inguinal ring and it's a pretty common site for herniation in males. So keep that in mind right there. It's just lateral to the inferior epigastric arteries lateral to that lateral umbilical fold. Medial to that um, lateral umbilical fold and inferior epigastric artery and vein, we have what's called Hesselbach's triangle, or the inguinal triangle right here. Essentially, this is a weak spot, not because it's got a big gap in it, but because it doesn't have as much muscular covering as some of the other areas. So, if we have a direct inguinal hernia, the gut, pushes against the anterior body wall. It's trying to find a way to relieve the pressure inside the abdomen and if it pushes out to a weak spot in this triangle we have what's called a direct inguinal hernia. Now in real life we'd have some parietal perineum covering this area so it's going to push that layer of parietal perineum ahead of it as it does so. Now if the hernia passes lateral to the lateral epigastric artery and vein it's likely going to try to find a way to go through the inguinal ring. It's going to go through the, soup, the deep inguinal ring here, through the inguinal canal, and potentially out the superficial inguinal ring. It may slide in and out, or it may wind up being kind of permanently stuck in that area heading towards the scrotum. 
but because there's an existing weak spot here, it can actually push through that area and not get covered by parietal perineum as it does so. Now that is an indirect inguinal hernia because it's going into the inguinal region, but it's taking a very roundabout way to do it, going through the deep inguinal ring, inguinal canal, superficial inguinal ring, and potentially into the scrotum, or in the um, chance that it does happen to a female into the area of the labia majora. Last but not least, inferior to the inguinal ligament, parallel to the eventual femoral artery and vein, we have a space called the femoral canal that usually houses some lymphatics. Now artistically this is being a little bit too generous. This is a, not a big wide open space like we're seeing here. What the illustrator is trying to show is that there is a potential space there and if gut herniates alongside that femoral nerve, you then have what's known as a femoral hernia and it's going to be herniating down into the upper thigh alongside the psoas major and iliacus muscles as they exit to get to the upper thigh as well. Okay, that's it for me. I hope you guys have a great day.